Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Salatu ve selamu ala eşrafil enbiya vel mursalin. Rahmetun lil alemin. Abil Qasim Muhammed sallallahu aleyhi ve aleyhi ve sellem. Brothers and sisters, selamu aleyküm ve rahmetullahi ve barakatuhu. The topic, as you would expect, is broad enough to engage us for many days, rather than just the 15 or 20 minutes that we can sum up what we want to share with you. Um, since we are reassessing the notion of the Savior, the notion of the Imam Mahdi coming in the future to restore justice in the world as such. We are talking about restorative justice, justice that has been violated through the political dynasties, through the political events in the history, and it is something that has been on the minds of all Muslims for a long time. That here we are in 2022, and yet we see that the Ummah is far away from even the minimum requirements of distributive justice. We have poverty in our backyards. We have so many miserable things happening all over the world, and we are still struggling to meet even the minimum challenge of zakat, that how we can help the communities around the world to become better equipped wealth-wise, health-wise, so that they can look forward to what we call their own dignity within their own societies. What is a danger today is human dignity. We are, whenever there is when human life is threatened by poverty, by you know, lack of health care, all of these things, it leads to the loss of what we call the respect and the empathy that we give to all human beings as human beings. But I'm going to make it quite clear that when we discuss the issue of Imam Mahdi in the Twelve or Shiism, we always connect it with the Usul al-Din. Because if we talk about Usul al-Khamsa and Usul al-Din, and the two important Usul that are really marked off, because we have Tawheed, we have Nubuwa, we have Ma'ad, but there are two doctrines which create what we call the time to ponder about what could be the possible response for that? One is the idea on the doctrine of Adala, the justice of the divine. It's not that the Sunni brothers don't believe in justice, but it's not emphasized as Usuluddin. It is emphasized as the Fa'lullah. It is the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that who is going to deliver what is asla for the Ummah, for the what is the best and advantageous for the Ummah. In the Shia tradition, Adala is part of the Usul. Now, it is, it is that belief which creates what we call the necessity of continuous guidance in the community. The function of revelation, the way Nubuwa came, is to guide humanity, to lead them not only towards the Tawheed, but also to the society that will be built on Tawheed. Unity of human beings, connection of human beings, but also informed by the justice that should prevail at all levels of human interaction. So you have fa'al wal infa'al, they both are based on the good behavior of human beings towards one another. And you find that that becomes the touchstone of 
what we are talking about, the continuation of the guidance. Do we need a guidance only for a certain time or do we always need the guidance? So one of the ideas that is new in the usul din is the imama itself. Whether imama is aqlan wajib or sam'an wajib. The Mu'tazila and the Ashaira, they, they, you know, discuss this issue. I'm not going to go into that. I simply want to say that human beings are in need of guidance, whether through the Prophet or through the Imam. There has to be someone to guide them. And that guidance comes not only through bringing the revelation which the Prophet did, but to continue to elaborate on the revelation and the Sunnah together. So when we talk about wahi, we are talking about the Quran and the Sunnah together. They both are part of the wahi which comes to guide humanity. Now, that wahi is not simply contained in the book, but it is also the exemplary life of the Prophet, the Sahaba, and the Ahlul Bayt, all of them are representing and reflecting what we call the best in humanity. And those are the examples that are to be followed. So one can see that the central doctrine of Adala and the central doctrine of Imama co connect us to the question of who is the Imam today? Who is the Imam today? And that's what is spark, sparking what we call the discussion among the Shia. If there is the question of imama, then this imama has to become available at all times in the human history. And that imama is to be providing the guidance to humanity. So we are looking at a very important doctrine. And that doctrine is the idea that there has to be continuum in the revelation itself. How? It's not the, because Khatmul Anbiya is the one who brought the last revelation. But the revelation has to continue to guide humanity until the day of judgment. And therefore, there is a need for elaborating the revelation from period to period. Our scholars in the past used to talk about the hundred years and hundred years and at each passing, passing of the Quran, they said there will be a mujaddid, there will be someone who will come and guide the community. So that is something quite interesting to note that the Shia doctrine is not, does not emphasize the Mahdawiyya. It emphasizes the Imam of the Imam. The actual title of the 12th Imam in the Shia writings is Al-Qa'im bi Amrillah. The one who upholds the command of God. And this is very important to keep in mind. Or it is al hujjat min Allah. The proof of existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. More than the idea of Mahdi, it is the idea of Al-Qa'im. The idea of al-hujjah that are pre preeminent in the tradition. Here we come, I think, to understand an important aspect that will grow an important part of what we call the intellectual tradition in Islam and in Shia tradition. The most important aspect is the relation between reason and revelation. It's very important to keep in mind. Our scholars, whether Shia or Sunni, they all paid attention to how we can say that there is talazum between wahi and aql. Are the conclusions of aql similar to the conclusions of wahi, or are the conclusions of wahi similarly applicable in the conclusions of the reasoning? This is what we call the area of ishtihad. And there's been the most important aspect of the belief in the 12th Imam. The Imama here is not simply telling us that there is already wahi and there is already guidance coming from the wahi, 
from the, from the Quran, from the scripture, from the sunnah. But there is a further elaboration that is needed. What we call in the modern language, textual hermeneutics. How to interpret the text. Because the text is an important part of our decision making about the solutions that the Ummah needs. The Ummah is not willing to accept anything that comes purely from the reason, from the rational aspects of the discussion. The Ummah says, we want to see the text. We want to see where our Prophet has said it, where the Sahaba have said this or this or that. And on the basis of which, we are going to guide the community. Because keep in, let's keep in mind that the idea of Mahdi is the divinely guided model exemplar. The divinely guided Imam is the one who is going to set the tone of the hermeneutics. Because hermeneutics could become extremely subjective. If I'm looking at a particular ayah, I'm looking at a particular hadith, then I apply my own reasoning and my own subjective understanding to something that is objectively in front of me. The objective part is the text itself. But the text is waiting for the ishtihad to come forward. And therefore we find that there has been from the very beginning a struggle to see where human reasoning can lead us in our textual understanding of the wahi and where wahi can afford us an interpretation that is compatible to the reasoning. Because they both have to be compatible somehow because we are living in an age where only textual information is unable to convince the audience. We need the conviction power of reason to go into the text of the, of the Wahi, and that's where the idea of Imam Mahdi becomes very important. What I'm talking about is that we are more interested in Shia tradition to speak about the role of Imam, Dawlat Imam, as the guide of the community, as the guide of the Ummah. And this guide of the Ummah will ultimately lead to the connection that we have in the Sunni tradition which is the idea of the Mahdi. If you look at the Ahadith in the Siha Sitta, they all speak about the coming of the Mahdi. They all are confirming that there will be time when the Mahdi will be needed. But what I'm suggesting is that in Shia tradition, earlier than the Imama is the question of Mahdawiyya, which is commonly found among Muslims. You find that in Tabari, for example, the poet Farazdaq, Farazdaq meets Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As on the 7th of Zil Hijjah. The Iyawain of Hussein ibn Ali is in Mecca. And he meets and he says to Farazdaq says to Abdullah ibn Amr that Hussein ibn Ali is the Mahdi. He is going and he'll become the king. You see what's expected here? To take the power from the, from the zalimin, from the wrongdoers, and put it in the hands of the one who deserves to rule. So the idea of Mahdi was always connected with the ideal ruler. The one who will be the Khalifatullah. This is what Ibn Khaldun is telling us. He says that, yes, there is this common belief among Muslims, but what it means is that Mahdi is Khalifatullah. He will come in the future to establish the kingdom of God. I'm using Christian terms. That's not what we say. He will come to establish the rule of justice and equity. That's what will happen. So you find that the idea is very much found among the Muslims. For us, Duk, when he has met Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, he's looking for Imam Hussein in the vicinity of Makkah, and he says, he, somebody says, in that tent is Hussein ibn Ali. Tabari tells us this, by the way. And, and he comes to Hussein ibn Ali, and he says, you are going to be the ruler. And Imam Hussein says, no, I'm not the ruler. I'm not going to be the ruler. In other words, there is what we call ihtiyat, that no, this is not happening now. 
Don't try to create, you know, another problem when we have several other problems facing the Ummah at this time. We are talking about 60 Hijrah, by the way, just a year before the Karbala is going to take place. Imagine how early people are expecting for the justice to happen. I, I'm adding a footnote here, by the way, that the footnote is this, that the Quran is teaching us that one of the mission of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is to establish the rule of justice and equity on earth. One of the ideals of the Prophet is that the Ummah is going to be self-determining, self-sufficient Ummah based on justice and equity. In other words, the ideal rule is very clearly, the ideal rule is very clearly the rule of the Sharia. In what sense Sharia? Sharia is the embodiment of the divine justice. That this is where the justice is located. Having that in mind, by the way, what I have suggested in my own writings is that the Quran made a clear promise that if the Muslims were to believe and to act in accordance with the Quran and the Sunnah, then they will be the one to establish the rule of justice and equity. That's the fulfillment of what we call the leadership of Mahdi. Now, you combine that with the Ilm al-Kalam, and Ilm al-Kalam is leading us towards, by the way, what it, whether it is Bakilani, Taftazani, Sharif al-Jorjani, all of them are leading us to establish quite clearly that imama is necessary naqlan, sam'an, not aqlan. Because inni jailuka lin nasa imama is clearly pointing to the idea that there has to be a leader. And that leadership is something that will come all the time and it will be there to guide humanity. I want to bring quickly to conclusion what I am trying to say. That the Quran is promising something which has been embedded in Shia Kalam. Shia theology is more interested, whether you are looking at Sharif al Murtada, Sheikh Mufid, or anybody else, they are more interested to show us that Imama has to be something that has to be believed and supported by the Ummah. You need the rightful Imama of the rightful Imam who can lead us through example, to the establishment of the ideal rule. When will this happen is not mentioned anywhere. You know, we have what we call tahrim at tawqeet. You don't fix the time when this will happen. We simply want to tell you that, yes, I think there will be a time, and that time, religious time in future, is not what we, you and I understand about time. Rather, the religious time is the one that says, you need to live in faith, that God can intervene in history. This is something that we need to keep in mind in the modern times, that we have not been able to establish a rule of justice as yet in the world. Look around yourself, whether it is Europe, North America, or anywhere else. The rule of justice is far away. Everybody says we want to establish justice, and the justice will be established through democratization or through the constitutionalism or through the human rights. But you and I know quite well that we are still far away from it. Our effort is being led to that. The 12 Shiism, and I would say Islam as a whole, is saying that there will be time when you will see the rule of, rule of God coming on the earth, and that rule will be based on what the Quran teaches about justice. And that justice will come and become the cornerstone of that political system. You and I are awaiting that, that justice, by the way. When, when the Shia say, Ajjal Allah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif, this is what they mean, by the way. May God hasten the coming back of the Imam so that we have a rule of justice. So the major function of Mahdi is to establish a political system that is ideal. 
a political system that is able to unite people, that is able to provide them the idea of justice and distributive justice. As long as we continue to struggle as the Ummah in establishing justice, we are doing the work of Mahdi and we are putting his work to be ahead as much as we can. Thank you very much.